will change us. It's living, it's active. Sharpening two-edged sword that discerns the heart. And so, Father, I pray that you just do a work in us tonight. Lord, thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for what you're going to do. And, Lord, what you've done in the past. Seen many miracles take place. Seen many people's prayers answered. Seen many people healed. And so, Lord, praise you for that. Praise you. And I ask, Lord, that you continue to work your wonderful, wonderful miracles in people's lives, Lord, where they get restored and healed, marriages healed, and the Spirit is healed. Lord, you do those things. So thank you, praise you, and then we ask this in Christ's precious name. Amen. All right. Thanks to Joel. He's out in uh, uh, helping Sheila tonight in the children's department, but he filled in for me last week and should have finished up Isaiah 59. If he didn't, that's okay. We're moving to Isaiah 60 anyway. He did finish it up. Praise the Lord. I didn't ask him if he finished it up, but I gave, he had the last few notes, so hopefully that would take place. So we're in Isaiah chapter 60. And uh, let me just lay out before you, this chapter is going to talk about the millennial reigns. And everyone in here know what the millennial reign is. It's a thousand years, that's a millennium, and it's a thousand years where Christ will reign upon the earth. Now let me tell you kind of what takes place up until then. We're here on this side of the, the rapture of the church. When the rapture of the church takes place, God calls his people up. It's believed, and we'll get into this in our future studies, and not in Isaiah necessarily, but we will in Revelation. We'll find out when God removes the church. And if you look, and you'll find this, uh, I believe in Thessalonians, where he talks about he removes the one that's standing in the way of the Antichrist or standing in the way of of sin totally going rapid. And so what he does, he removes the church. He removes all the believers. And this is a common thought. He removes all the believers and, and everyone that believes in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ will either A, be raptured, or they'll die before the rapture. Bodies will be put in the ground or cremated or whatever happen to your body. Don't worry about that sort of thing because you know what? God's able to resurrect a body. It doesn't matter if you got eaten by a bunch of sharks in the sea. He'll resurrect that body. So what will happen on the day of the rapture is that the dead in Christ will rise first. Y'all read that back again. I used to say, well, they beat us up, but they don't beat us up. They just rise first And then we, which are alive and remain together, we all go up. And so that's the rapture of the church. When that takes place, then I just want to throw this out there so you'll kind of know. The world, you think the world's going to be stunned. They're all gone. What happened to all these Christians? These churches are not filled no more. Well, let me just give you a little bit of thought. There's been many of, of, of great men of God like Spurgeon, Moody, and many others that think that all the church will not be raptured because all of them are not Christians. They don't all believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. So you might have some churches that 10% are missing. You might have some churches, I hope this one, 100% are missing. But, however, you'll have some people that will still be in churches because they didn't receive Christ. You'll have people in in the world that didn't receive Christ. They'll still be here. But for the most part, those that are in Christ will be raptured. And just to throw you a little bit more statistics out there so you'll kind of know this, I studied with a, a years ago with a man by the name of Tom McCall, and he was a uh, doctor in theology and had all this, these letters behind his name. And uh, we were talking one day, and I said, what's your thoughts on how many will make it? How many will be actually called off the earth? And he, along with many others of, of their study, believed that it would, might be 2% of the world's population. 
We're not talking 10% or 90%. We're talking 2%. He said they'll be so less that maybe the world won't even recognize they're gone. So that's the thought out there. Now, now that's just his thought. That's the opinion. That's not scripture. That's opinion. However, when we're all out of here, we're raptured out of here, there's a, I said something Sunday morning, Deborah called me on it. Now, when the rapture of the church doesn't necessarily start the seven years of tribulation, I know there can be a little time period in there where before the Antichrist gets going and, and the signing of the covenant and all that. So there could be a little, little gap time in there. May not be. I don't know. It just depends. When the church is out of here, I'm just going to be honest with you. I'm in heaven. So, you know, I'm doing other things. I'm not concerned with that at that point. I'll let the Lord deal with that. However, we're out of here. The seven years starts at some point. The seven years of tribulation. That's called Jacob's uh, trouble. That's called where God will judge Israel, mainly a judgment upon God's people. And there will be, there's thoughts that when we leave here, and you're going to find this out in chapters uh, 6, 7, you're going to find, in Revelation, you're going to find out that when we leave here, there's a common thought that there's no other Christians left, there's no believers left upon the earth when we enter into the seven years of tribulation, or when the earth enters into the seven years of tribulation. However, we have a great God. Even though the God that brings judgment, he sends 144,000 uh, born again, filled with the Spirit, Jews. 12,000 from each tribe, and they'll be witnesses upon the whole earth. And he sends the two witnesses, and we don't want to get into all that details, but he does. People do get saved during the seven years of tribulation. So I'm coming up to telling you at the end of the seven years of tribulation, Jesus comes back, and where does, according to the scriptures, does he put his foot on? Where does he put his foot? Second coming. On the what? Mount of Olives. Where did he leave from? Mount of Olives. And what did the angel say? The same one that you see ascended will descend again. Right here. So you can set your clock if you want to figure out that coming of Christ. When that covenant signed or the kick off of the seven years, you can just count the days and you can look up in the sky. He's coming. And he'll put his foot on the Mount of Olives. We know that he sets everything right at that point. He destroys the Antichrist, throws him in the pit. And... Uh, all the non-believers at that point uh, died and, and, and troubled. And some, there, there's a little bit of thought through the seven years of tribulation without going into millennial reign still, uh, in other words, are still lost. There's a thought out there. Now, Deborah's shaking her head. No, that's not true. That's, I'm just giving you opinions. There's lots of opinions out there about that time, day and age. But let's... Our opinion is that everybody upon the earth during that seven year tribulation, the ones that don't go to heaven are judged. The ones that do are in the God's kingdom go into the millennial reign where Christ will set up his kingdom right there out of Jerusalem. Now that's not the new Jerusalem. Y'all need to understand this. Not the new Jerusalem. New Jerusalem doesn't come down until after. Now there's thoughts upon that too. Some people say, well, it comes down then. We don't worry about that. Let's just, let me move on my time frame. But the thousand year reign, the millennial reign, is where Christ will be ruling out of Israel. Now he will, he wanted to, in the beginning of our, when, when the earth was born without form and he, and he made it perfect and he established what he made and in uh, five days and made man, remember that? And he said it was very good, and he started to mankind. He intended for Adam to live in an environment that was perfect. We know that the devil, however, the accuser and deceiver, hung out. He came into the garden, and we know the story. He deceived Eve, and Eve gave Adam, and they both deceived, and by the way, theology teaches you, the scriptures teaches you, 
Sin came into the world through one man. I'd like to blame it on Eve, but I can't. Scripture says sin came into the world through one man, and sin was delivered from the world through one man, and that's the man Jesus. So, now we're in the millennial reign. What's happening in the millennial reign? Well, the church, we uh, are part of that too. We're kind of like, and I'm, I'm really going to just, I'm just going to leave it like this. We're God's workmen, so we're doing things for the kingdom of God. Don't ask me what all the things will be that you'll be doing, because I, you just read the scriptures and see if you can figure it out. So, we're in this millennial reign. This millennial reign, when Christ rules, he's establishing another environment that should be and will be godly, good, everything will be good. You'll understand what it's like to live under what God intended man to live under. Now that thousand year millennial reign is what's being talked about here to Israel. They have to look way into the future here. And there will come a time that Israel, what does Israel, what does the Bible teach us to pray, pray for Israel about? Peace. When does Israel get their peace? When Jesus comes. When does Israel get complete? total peace when he comes back at the end of the seven years of tribulation. All Jewish people, according to the scriptures, will see him and, and, and yet they'll go, oh, it was, you know. And God will have mercy and we believe that all Jewish people will be saved at that moment. Now, because they, they realize they missed their visitation. Jesus even commented about that in the New Testament where he said, you know, I visited you and you missed it, basically. His heart was broken. You see, you read 1 John chapter 1, verses 11 and 12. It was, I come to my people. My people didn't receive me. So uh, he, sent his, uh, he shed his grace upon all people. Remember, he said, those that uh, come to me, I give the right to become children of God. So the Gentiles are right in there. That's who we are. We're Gentiles. So this particular passage here is uh, directed toward the nation Israel. And this is what it says in verses 1 through 3. Arise, shine, for your light has come, explanation mark, that's coming for you. And the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and the deep darkness the people. But the Lord will rise over you. Now he's talking about, he put a little bit of the trouble in there as well. Talking about those, that uh, seven years of Jacob's trouble. But the Lord will rise over you and his glory will be seen upon you. The Gentiles, now the Gentiles are mentioned, shall come to your light and the kings to the brightness of your right raising. So let me, let me just say this first of all. Who knows what replacement theology means? Go ahead, Deborah. Tell them what replacement theology is. Basically, it's just that the church is replaced Israel. Right. So that's what, what that is teaching now, that Israel was done away with, and they're just inside now, the church is the stand from the Christ. Yeah. We live in a time of grace. That's what we live in, church age. The church will, the church will never take, place, take Israel's place, never. We're full, uh, the church th that has 90% uh, uh, probably Gentiles in it for the most part, maybe even higher than that, but it never does take the place of Israel. Now, there's a thought out there that the church does, that the church takes the place of Israel. False teaching. Never does. Because he mentions it right here in Isaiah, your glory, Israel's glory, you'll be, you'll, the Gentiles will see that. Now, in this millennial time of reign, the same will be saw. They will see that. That's what they're talking about there. 
Um, Arise, shine, for your light has come. Now, we know that according to Scripture, that light, when they refer to light, when the Scriptures refer to light, it's most of the time making a reference of God, of, of the light of Christ or the, the brightness of Christ, the, the coming of Christ. In the transfiguration, y'all remember that in the Scriptures? It's, it's told that it was, there was brightness in, in those men seeing the glory of God. Well, uh, I've even heard of, and I won't say it's, you know, I can't document it, but there's people that claimed that the Shekinah glory of God comes in like a great light. I've never seen that or experienced that, but I'll just tell you this. I'll tell you that at this point in time he's talking about, the glory of God that's risen in you, it expels all darkness. And it, let's think about when we got saved just for a minute. Let's go back to that, time, that point in time in your life when you did not have God. According to the Bible, according to Scripture, you were walking in darkness. You was groping around in darkness. You, you didn't know where you was going. You were, you were headed to hell, and your, your father at the time, the devil, and I'll put it like that because there's only two fathers mentioned in the Bible in that aspect of control. Uh, he was keeping you in darkness. What he was doing was enticing you with all the sinful nature and such, and you were just living a life that you thought, at least I'll throw mine out there. I don't know. I can maybe explain mine. I can't explain yours. But my life was, I didn't think there was a God. That's how I was deceived. I figured there's no God. If there's no God, there's no judgment. If there's no judgment, there's no heaven, there's no hell. You just plant me in the ground, I'll push up some daisies, and that's it. And that was my thought. That's how he deceived me. And that was darkness, because without God in your life, you're in darkness. That's what it's basically saying. When Christ come into your life for the first time, and boy, this resonated with me when a preacher told me this afterwards. It resonated so well. He, we were talking about our salvation's experience, and you know, the first time that God spoke to me, he shed some light in the heart. I mean, he really did. He, he brought in a glorious uh, message through the Word of God, into my heart and it, it kind of brightened things up and it kind of illuminated the fact that God was real. And then that light got brighter and brighter to the point that you wanted to come to Christ. He's calling you through his scriptures. He's calling you through his spirit. It's his spirit that's speaking to you. And so he expels that, Deborah. Yes. And Jesus said to many of them, How great is the darkness? So, is it possible that we can have darkness abode in us or, or in us? Now, let me tell you about this. When you got saved, let's just look at this for a minute. When you got saved, you answer this question. Did Jesus forgive you of all your sin? Did Jesus come into your life at that moment? Did he change you? Did he fill you with his Holy Spirit? We'd all say yes to that, wouldn't we? But does man dabble after that with things that are not godly? Let's just put it that way. Things that are sinful? Christians do it all the time. And so Jesus would ask that question, how great is that darkness? I mean, look, this is what God's Word does. You fill your spirit with God's Word and with God, it forces out anything that's not godly. I guess that's the best way I can say it. Everybody agree with that? Okay. The more of God's word 
and the more of, of his spirit and the more of the practice of God's word that we put to practice in our life. In other words, we actually practice it. Like sharing the good news. Like living a righteous life. We practice that. Does that not expel more darkness? It does. And so what usually happens is that God's intention here is for the glory of the Lord to shine through you. That's what he did with Jesus on transfiguration. The glory of God shined through Christ. Christ obeyed God. Well, you say, well, he's God. I, I, I often, well, every time I look at people's faces, I think they're saying, well, he's God. He's God. What's happened to you? Yes, but he's all man too. Don't leave, leave, don't leave that one out. But still, the light of the glorious God is shines through him. He was a great light. And he said it to the world. He said, the light had come into the world, but man loves darkness more than light. So, you know, these sort of things, we see that and we, we think, oh, wow, you know. Okay, so Gentiles, on the other hand, we're the Gentiles here. We shall come to the light that we see that's in the, the Jewish people at this particular time. This is talking about the millennial reign. But let's just talk about this for a moment from the aspect of us being Gentiles coming to Christ when we saw the light for the first time. Uh, uh, what's the old song? Can I help me out? I saw the light. No more darkness. No more night. So when you saw the light, what you're saying there is that you experienced and, and even that word been messed with today, but you really have experienced God, and you've taken Him in, and boy, everything changes. What does the Scripture say about the, the, the new man versus the old man? What does He say? The, the old man begins to live in you, and behold, all things, all the old ways, what happened to them? Passed away. Now, we relate the word passed away to someone that's, that's gone on. They're gone. They're dead. So the old man passed away, and behold, all things become new. Matter of fact, the scriptures teach us that we're a new what? Creation. Well, wait a minute. You know, I still got the same body. What is the scripture talking about there? He's talking about all the thoughts, all the intents of the heart, all the person. It's not talking about the body. It's talking about your spirit. I used to think God was dead. There wasn't no God. That, now I'm a new creation. There is a God. And he's wonderful. And, you know, you go from there. But, but let me tell you what. God makes a new creation. If you let him, if you let him, and I'm telling you, we got to give him permission sometime. I, I promise you, if you hold on to your life and never give God permission to do anything in your life, you'll never experience the magnitude of God's glory because you ain't let him. You ain't surrendered yourself. Uh, I'll give you an idea. I heard someone say we we're talking about working in ministries. And I heard someone here recently or whatever had a desire to work in a particular ministry. Well, you know what is going to happen? If they don't do anything about it, they're never going to experience God's goodness and God's glory. But when they yield to it and say, Lord, I think you're calling me to this. And Lord, I'll tell you my thought. I couldn't be happy until I surrendered to the Lord, to the calling. Now, folks, I've told you on many occasions, God, you can call a lot smarter, a lot brighter, a lot, lot of different men that, you know, that speaks the English language a lot better than me. You can do a lot of things, God. Why don't you choose them? I could have said that to the Lord, but when the Lord impressed on me to get in the men, folks, I couldn't do anything but get in there because I wouldn't be happy if I wasn't in there. 
Now, let me tell you what happens to God when God fills a man with a calling, and all of us have a certain calling. I believe that with all my heart. We may have a calling right at this particular time to minister to our family. We may have a calling to maybe get into some sort of ministry helping young people or teenagers or older people. But wherever God has led you, when you finally yield to it and you get in, and you say, okay, Lord, I want to do this, you know. It goes with Scripture, too. Okay, Lord, I heard your Scripture. It says that if I'm tempted, you've made a way of escape. So, Lord, I'm going to submit to your way of escape, and I'm going to go that way. And then what happened? I don't know about you guys, but the more I surrender to God, the more I say yes to God and say a no to God or maybe to God, Things are better. Y'all ever heard the phrase, that man's on fire for God? Amen. Now, where does that come from? What, what's he doing different than you? Come on, to answer that question. I'm not going to what, what is that man on fire for God doing different than you are that you recognize it? God That's right. He has given... Every bit of himself to God. And we as Christians, I know that I was all in. I know that day that I received Jesus, I gave him all. But at the same time, folks, as life goes on, we draw some of that back. It has to be daily. To be daily. And what did he say about that in the scripture? What did Jesus say? What did he say? Die daily. Die daily. And then he said... And take up your cross. And then follow me. And you know, the, 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 I think we do that one, two, three step. Sometimes we get the first one down. Sometimes we get the second one. When we get all three of them down, we're on fire for God. That's just as, pretty much as simple as it can be. And you know what? Uh, it doesn't happen that way all the time, but however... Now, he goes into all of this in, in Isaiah in 4 through 13. He talks about the great treasures that's coming. And he says in, in 4 here, Lift up your eyes all around and see. They all gathered together. They come to you. Your sons shall come from afar. Your daughters shall be nursed at your side. Then you shall see and become radiant. And your heart shall swell with joy. You know, sometimes they just have a great way of saying things in the Word of God. And when you talk about swelling with joy, you know, he's talking about a time of peace. He's talking about a time of, of goodness that you'll experience. That And you know... Uh, have you all ever heard the, um, the biblical comment mentioned many over in, I think it's in, in uh, Psalms, where David says, my cup runs over? Has your cup ever ran over? <laughs> you know, I was at a, my aunt's uh, memorial years ago, and her son was a preacher, and he was the one doing her memorial for his mother. And he was talking about her cup overflowed. And he was talking about things she did in life, her Christian, or, or, or her, um, her responsibility in Christ that she did. That she was always thinking about the Lord, always doing for the Lord, always serving God, always praying, always studying, always going higher and higher in Christ. And he made the comment, and her cup overflowed. And we can be there. We can be there. We want to be there. I want my cup to overflow. And, you know, it overflows with joy. I got I to gotta admit to you, I'm, you know, there's days I'm the happiest guy on the earth. Y'all ever, you may be the happiest guy on earth. And then there's days when you're not the happiest guy on earth. And there's days when you're not the happiest guy on earth. What's the difference in those days? Somebody tell me. What's the difference? Though humanity sinks in a little bit. Uh, 
problems of the world sinks in a little bit. And I'm just not the happiest guy. You know, with me, it doesn't like that because I can get who I am in Christ. Yeah. 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 And, you know, and, and that's bred into us. You can do this. You can handle it. You can fix your own problems. I, I mean, basically, I was taught that from a young age. You know? I'll just give you a a short example. When I was coming up, I wanted a motorcycle. And my parents, at first, when I said, I want a motorcycle, they had a little hesitation there. I don't know if you need one. And you kept bugging them. I want a motorcycle. And that went from, I don't think you need one, well, we'll think about it. So what you're doing, you're softening them up. You're getting them to where they need to get so you can get your motorcycle. And then you get your motorcycle. And then you ride it. And guess what? You crash it. Matter of fact, you crash your brother's motorcycle with him on the back. Yeah, Frankie will tell you this story. He got his first. He let me drive it and we crashed it. And you know what my father told me? He said, you crashed it, you fix it. (laughs) And I learned at an early age that it was up to you. If you're going to have somebody get something done, you're going to get it fixed, you're going to have to do it. Right? I've always been the type of person that you give me something to do, I want to fix it then and there. I want to get it out. Get it away. And I like long-term projects too. I've had long-term, Deborah can tell you this, I, don't, I just envision that it's going to take a while, and I'll work on a little bit at a time, but I'll get there. That was bred into me at an early age. You fix your own problems. That's basically what, and it started with a motorcycle. But it's in life everywhere. Well, I can fix this. I can do this. And then when you come and you meet Jesus, and you start down your road and your relationship with him, you find out that you're still trying to implement some of those things. And let me tell you what the Spirit does. God works in the same way you work. No, He doesn't. God works in mysterious ways. And then God begins to tell you, well, I want you to do this. this. But Lord, you know, I wrecked that. I can fix that. That's no problem. That's just some metal. Do you want to do what? God has a different way. And you have to learn to submit to God's will when you can't see the results in the future. You can't see the long-term project that you think you put your hands to and you can fix it. Let me give you a good example of that. How many times have you prayed for so-and-so to get saved? Can't Can't even count. Now, you're believing by faith that your prayer coupled with God no doubt God's the big factor here. That person's a sinner. You're, you're praying God's will. God's will and none should perish, but all come to everlasting life. So you're praying God's will, and you're praying, you're praying, you're praying, you're praying. And you never, 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 never give up because you know that one day God's going to do something. Now, if God calls on that person's heart and they reject God, I mean, that's, you know, still he done his, his, what he is supposed to do. And you know what? Sometimes it's hard for me when it comes to that. I got to be honest with you. I want to see people in the kingdom of God now. <laughs> Let's do it right now. Let's get them in here. Just do it. Now, I, I'm, getting that way, I'm getting more that way as the closer we see the rapture of the church coming. I'm almost like, and I don't want to be, in no way I want to be irreverent to God in my way I pray or any of that. But I'll say, Lord, if there ever was a day, today's a good one. Get them in there today. Let's don't wait till next week. Now, I wouldn't say that to the Lord in that type of tone. I would just say, Lord, please have mercy. Get them in today. Because I'm afraid that there's going to come a day when it'll be too late. So are you. And also... When does God quit visiting? 
a life. When does God quit? Does he always keep visiting that life until that person comes to know him? Does he not never give up? There's a time, Lord, uh, apparently Jesus came to the Jewish people and they missed their visitation. He tried to, he tried in many ways to enter in and they wouldn't let him. And then what did happen? He went to the Gentile. He'll go to someone that will let him in. I just pray, God, please, when, they come, when you come to them, let them open that door. I know you stand there and knock, but let them open that door. God, help them to open that door. And, and, and I'm telling you, I, I was scared into the kingdom of God, but at the same time, I, I, God just impressed on my heart, and I couldn't do nothing but open that door. So, you know, I'm just going to tell you guys, uh, when God comes calling on you, and he will, and he asks you to do something, you're studied up, you're prayed up, He's got you ready. Then walk in it. And, let, and watch the glory of God. Watch other people say, man, I wish I could do that. I wish I could be on fire for God. You can. All of us can. We just got to walk in it. Uh, anyway, I'll final last thought here. You know, when he says, your joy shall swell. I just want to tell you, this is my testimony. You may have one similar. When I met the Lord, He changed my life. Deborah had already had some knowledge of God. He come right back in. He changed her life real quickly. Now, Nanette had some knowledge of God. She was, she was probably in the, in the camp earlier than any of us. But then all of a sudden, Wayne got into that camp. All of a sudden, God started these revival fires in our, in our family. And one by one, I'm like that kid in, in, in children's church, he picked us off. One by one. Pow, pow, pow. But he got us in the kingdom. And let me tell you what I think made a huge difference. A huge difference. He saw that person, that next person in the family, saw those others had a real change. It wasn't fake. It wasn't, fun. It wasn't a new leaf they turned over. They watched and they saw so-and-so's different. So-and-so's not doing this no more. So-and-so's not doing that no more. So-and-so's been changed. I'm just telling you, they saw a fire. They saw a light. And that's what they were coming to. So, anyway, God's been merciful. God's been good. Anybody got any comment? Anybody, you want to praise the Lord about something? You want to brag on them a minute before we go home? Just don't ever you, give up with don't never give up. Right. Because uh, we never gave up praying that they were also far away from the Lord. And to hold on to faith. That's right. Because you may not see it. But I That's right. Because I'm in my family. In my family. Right. right. That's right. Every chance we get. That's right. Okay, last thought. When you get to heaven, let's say, uh, I, I pray the Lord doesn't tarry, but if he does, and we all go on to meet the Lord, one by one, after you spent your time with the Lord and just, your cup's overflowing big time at that moment. And you're just so ecstatic about life and about glory with God and all of that, eternal life, I should say. When you get past all that, ask the Lord, who was the first one that prayed for me? And you'll find out who that might be. And I'll tell you what, the Lord knows. And she's right. And the first one that prayed for you was the first one. 
that began to open that door that God would move on your life because he was concerned. Anyway, I'm going to thank that person. I think it's my grandmother on my mother's side. I think she's the one. But we'll see. Anyway, uh, may God bless you guys. Let's, let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the word of God. Thank you, Lord, for, for each and every one of us in here that, that, Lord, call upon you. That, Lord, you came into our life, you changed us, you, you made us a new person. And one day, Lord, we're going to get to see you. Our faith and our, our sight is going to be so amazing when that faith turns into sight and I see you for the first time whether in the rapture of the church or maybe I, Lord, you, you got it to where I go on before the rapture of the church. Either way, Lord, I'm going to see you. And Father, it's going to be a great, great meeting. Lord, I praise you and thank you, Lord Jesus, for all that you've done for me. Lord, all that you've done for these that are here tonight. And Lord, as we leave here tonight, let us not ever, Lord, become stagnant or our our complacent about what you've done, Lord, and what you're doing. Father, you are still at work today in the hearts of men and women. So, Father, I pray that you would just stir, stir it up in us, Lord. We need to be stirred up. We need to be called, Lord. We need to be prompted. We need to be, Lord, encouraged to walk in your ways. So, Lord Jesus, when we leave here today, let us say yes, 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 yes to you. And, Father, no to the devil. And no to the things of the world. Let us be separate. Let us live for you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.